As you receive the mic, if you could please state your firm and your name so that we can have that for the folks that are participating on the webcast. We have um, Carrie and Michael who will have the mics and we'll be going around. So we'll go ahead and start, Simeon. Hello? There you oh, go. Simeon Gutman, uh, Morgan Stanley. Uh, for the guidance for fiscal 17, uh, you showed EPS down 6 to 12 percent. I presume that includes buyback, uh, which implies that EBIT dollars are going to be down somewhere in the 11 to 17 percent range. Uh, if we back into that on a dollar basis, it's several uh, billion dollars of EBIT dollar decline. We talked about wage investments again, a billion and a half. Uh, we assume the e-commerce losses stay around a billion. That leaves still multi-billions left. Um, I presume that's the price element. Um, and then there's a wide range around that. Uh, are there other pieces? And can you sort of uh, give a little bit more clarity uh, if, that, if the dimensions well, of that are exactly? Yeah, I'm not sure about your several billion. You're talking about FY17 earnings per share? What we, is that what you were asking about? Yes. 70, what we said is 75% of the decrease is related to the um, billion five in wage and store structure. So you can do the math from there. So it's not several billion beyond that. And e-commerce and price would be the e two other components the two, that we would yes. point to that continue. And as Neil showed you, the e-commerce the e profitability trend starts to improve over time, but it is that overlapping of the wage investment and these other investments at the same time. And we're trying to give ourselves some room as it relates to price. We can talk more about that if, if you guys would like. I think that's one of the key questions that I'm sure you would have on your mind. I just want to underline the wage decision that we made at least one more time. Um, this is a big investment in people. Between the two years in particular, it, it's significant. And I don't want people to miss that. And I think the 75% number that Charles mentioned needs to be well understood. And I, I guess I can relate to the fact that when we announced this change, which was, was back in February, both the $9 and the $10, that many might not have done the math or, or understood how to do the math, and maybe we didn't give you enough information to do the math on the $10 jump. But together with those starting wage rate changes to 9 and 10 and the other investments that we called out, it was clear that was a big number. Um, I still, looking back, feel like that was smart. I think that was the right decision to make. Um, in some ways, it demonstrated leadership. Um, in other ways, it's a market reaction. But the outcome is that our associates deserve that, that wage increase and the performance that we will get from them and the relationship that we have and will develop with them going forward is a key strategic choice. This business has been about people and in 25 years it will be about people. Um, different skill sets in some cases and clearly technology has changed retail. Um, but this, this associate investment is one that, that I hope people will really take the time to understand. It's, it's of strategic significance. Michael. Hey, Rob. Morning, Robbie Ohms, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Your, your stock and a lot of retail stocks are down. Um, you gave us this sort of down up on the, um, you know, on the earnings outlook and I get all the investments and everything. Can you just walk us through the same store sales expectations? You know, and and how are same store sales trending now? And and what is the assumption for U.S. same store sales? You know, over that, over the guidance you gave us today. Yeah, Charles, maybe you and I comment a little bit, and then would ask Greg to, I suppose. But we've we've given guidance. Yeah, back in the second quarter, we we gave guidance to what we thought would be in the uh, in the third quarter. We're not here to give guidance today for the quarter, Robbie. Uh, but you did hear Greg say that uh, he expects that he's, he's, he's done a great job with this team at getting his traffic and comp, uh, comps up in the Walmart U.S., and he expects that will continue. I think one thing I would add, Robbie, is that it's important in the comp number to think about the components. We've got a super center comp number. We've got a neighborhood market comp number. We've got an e-commerce contribution to comp. What we don't know is what will happen with inflation, where will fuel prices be. We have some assumptions, obviously, around those numbers, but there are a lot of variables that go into play. I think, Greg, you should talk a little bit about the store experience because the only way to get sustainable comps is by really running great stores. 
We need a great experience with our customers. We need strong merchandising. There are a lot of pieces that go into making that happen. And I think you can look at the steps that we're taking and understand how they dovetail on each other to create that situation. Yeah, it does. It's, it sort of feeds in to your first point and also in terms of, of what we're paying our people. You know, it's interesting as I, as I get around our stores, most stores are now actually starting to pay bonuses for their associates, what we call my share. It's a big deal and one of the reasons is that sales are hitting what we expect and also to get clean, fast, friendly LinkedIn, we actually tied that into my share. It makes a big difference to our associates when we're recognising them, we're fixed starting rates, the stores are starting to, to bonus. And that in turn is creating better stores. Now the reality is, and the numbers show it, as I get around the stores, Doug, two out of three get a pass mark, one out of three don't. 67% have got clean, fast, friendly. Um, and just because they've got a pass mark on clean, fast, friendly doesn't mean that they're, they're great super centres yet. Um, but, you know, I'm guessing we've probably got three or four hundred out there that I would really rate as a fantastic shopping experience when I walk them. Then we've got a whole group in the middle that have, have, have improved, but we've got room, room to go further. There is no doubt in my mind that as you improve the shopping experience, the comps improve. You know, I'm in um, Olive Branch in Mississippi on, on Monday morning, half past seven. The manager's got no idea I'm going to turn up. And I walk in the store and he's standing there, he's got his iPad, department managers are working, they're engaged with, the, with their uh, MC40s, the handhelds. And he's come off a 7% comp on Sunday. He's got a business which is running a 4.2% comp year to date. And you can see it when you walk the store. I can equally go into stores that haven't got positive comps and I can see why. It's a store by store thing. There's lots of opportunity for us to get better and improve. And, you know, inflation will be what it is and other activities, but I know that we can grow the top line in this business, and we are. We had a good laugh with Greg. He knew he was in Olive Branch, but he wasn't sure if he was in Mississippi or Tennessee, so we, we finally figured that out. <laughs> I do know the capital of North Dakota. <coughs> That's good. Carrie, next question. Paul Trussell, uh, Deutsche Bank. I uh, just want to follow up on the comp question, and Greg, I do appreciate uh, your comments, uh, but I think there still is a little bit of a disconnect on the 3 to 4% sales CAGR expected in the out years for the Walmart U.S. business as you are reducing the growth of stores. If you can just help us uh, make that connection, particularly on the grocery business, which I believe in the last quarter uh, was still comping flattish, and obviously being the, the bulk of your mix needs to really take a, a meaningful tick up in order for you to achieve your goals. And similarly, uh, Neil, you outlined a 20 to 30 percent CAGR on the dot com business, yet in the second quarter, we just saw a deceleration to the mid teens. Help us please connect those dots. Um. You know, as, as Charles and Doug have said, you know, we've given the guidance. I, I, you know, I'm not going to do anything other than say I'm pleased with the momentum we're seeing in the business. Um, Doug mentioned general merchandise previously. Food, I'm also feeling better about. We're seeing more traffic, so we've got more customers visiting our stores. Um, we're seeing an improvement in units, they're trending north. And I know that we can build on the momentum that we've got. 3 to 4% total sales CAGR is what, you know, I and my team have signed up for and we know that we can do that. And, and this year, remember what I said, Walmart US should do around 3.5% this year. Yeah. And on food, Greg, you might want to talk a little bit about the opportunity in fresh and the inflation deflation arrangement in grocery right now. Yeah, sure. So um, fresh clearly you know, there's opportunities for us to, to do much better. You know, assortment, um, pricing. Um, as, as I get around and I, I look at what's happening with hard discounters, I see opportunities. A lot of work underway in terms of grocery. Um, we'll, you'll, we've 
identified to you that we will invest in price and we're going to. Um, we know what we want to do in that area and that's built again into our guidance. But we're already seeing some momentum and you know I'm really happy with how the grocery business is going. Share is going well. It's not startling and you wouldn't expect it to be. This is a really big ship and, and you've got to deal with it one piece at a time. But we're, we've got some momentum and you know we'll hold on to it. Paul, well, on the e-commerce side, um, I'd, I'd remind you guys of what I said at the end of the second quarter, which is that we've had pretty good growth in the U.S., both at Walmart.com and a, as well as at SamsClub.com. That's, uh, that's been inhibited by um, some, some challenges in our larger international markets. And just for context for, all, for everyone, the largest international markets for us are the UK, Brazil, and China. And so uh, it's obvious the, the competitive and economic issues that are, that are going on there. So as we think about, and any time you're going to give three years worth of kind of revenue growth guidance, you're going to have ups and downs along the way. And, and so we expect there to be ups and downs along the way. Um, we expect the U.S. to continue to perform well, both the U.S. and Sam's Club. We're obviously adding grocery, which is basically a whole other line of business to, uh, to the U.S. business to grow that. And then we don't expect the, the conditions to remain the same in the U.K. and, and China and Brazil forever. Um, we can't control those, of course, but we don't expect those to go on forever. So we feel pretty good. And, and the story is, is, is very similar to, uh, to Greg's, which is that the wheel's turning. So we've got the traffic, we're adding the assortment, we're adding the lines of business, and we're starting to see customer performance and, and frequency and other uh, key metrics start to uh, uh, start to improve. So, so it's you know it's anytime you give long-term guidance, it's it's hard. But that's the those are the breakdown of the components. Okay, Michael. Next question. Also, if you're asking the questions, if you could please stand for purposes of the webcast so that they can catch you on the camera. Hi, Matt Niemer with Wells Fargo. Um, so I have a question about customer lifetime value. When somebody goes from being a, a moderate shopper at Walmart five times a year to a moderate shopper online, I understand that multi-channel customers end up being great customers and they're very engaged, but on the more moderate side, what happens to lifetime value if somebody goes from the store to online only? Thanks. So store to online only, not multi in their relationship. I don't know that anyone... I, we haven't seen that behavior, Matt. So, um, you know, it's an interesting question. Of, Doug outlined and, and Charles the, the evolution of the business. So as we add e-commerce, obviously we're adding a, a business that's a lower operating income margin but a higher return, so less capital required to, to run that business. And so we're starting to see that mix out. But what we're seeing with customers is that they're, um, they're better Walmart, the brand Walmart customers. And so that's why we steered into what Doug called the sweet spot. And you can see that, um, that performance. We're not seeing a, a trade-off. We're, um, we're seeing an evolution and, and a growth. Okay, Carrie. Hi, it's Michael Lasser from UBS. So you outlined the investments for next year, operating margin is going to be down. What will drive operating margin expansion after that? And as part of that answer, can you talk about how the model is evolving? Part of what's happening with Walmart is the cost uh, that historically have been burdened by the customer where they're walking through the store, uh, picking products off the shelf, checking out in the aisle, or paying for shipping is now being burdened by the company. And how is that going to impact the company's long-term profitability? So both of those yeah, the, questions. The, Thank you. The, one of the reasons why the, the margin improvement gets better is because we don't anticipate the significant wage investments that we were making this year and next year in the go-forward plan. The market, as it relates to wages, will certainly ebb and flow over time and will respond appropriately, but the amount of the investment and the amount of our investment won't be anything like what we're doing in these two years. So it springs back out of the sheer nature of that. And then number two, the e-commerce margins continue to improve, profitability as it relates to the trend of e-commerce improves. Your question about picking orders for customers is a really good one, and we studied it closely in the UK. And as that business went to delivery in the market, you may be aware the, the grocers went from a store to a store plus delivery business and then backed into pickup. What we found was the returns related to delivery took a long time to mature. It's very difficult to make money delivering food. But the pickup 
um, aspect drove returns up quite quickly relative to delivery for sure. So what we're positioning ourselves to do is to win with the customer in this seamless environment. As we mentioned before, they won't actually think that much about whether or not it's in the store or picked up or delivered. Over time, they're just going to think I'm shopping at Walmart. And it's through that blend of the relationship with the customer that we'll be able to generate strong returns. So it's not just looking at it in isolation, although pickup itself has a nice return, it's also looking at the overall relationship. Bernie Sosnick, my new affiliation is Madison Global Partners. Uh, with regard to neighborhood markets, I have difficulty reconciling some of the points. Same store sales growth has been strong, which would imply improved profitability, and yet you said that you're slowing the growth rate for neighborhood markets because profitability has to improve. You were not satisfied with some of the stores that opened over the last few years. Could you give us a synopsis of where neighborhood markets stand? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so we've got, you know, if you include the, the 100 express stores now, we've got, you know, circa 500 plus neighborhood markets. And we've got some that are very mature and some that have recently opened. Um, so you get quite a difference in performance based on the maturity of the store. And you also get quite a difference in performance based on who they're up against in terms of their competitive set. So um, to be completely candid, when we are up against someone who is really good at running supermarkets, frankly our fresh offering has not been on par with what it takes to win in those environments. And if we're opening stores where the competitor is not particularly strong, then generally we will do pretty well. And a lot of that is driven by some pretty significant price gaps that we can generate. So, you know, we need to fix what we do in Fresh. We need to make sure we do a great job with the services, whether it's grocery, home shop, whether it's pharmacy. And so it's appropriate that we be pretty thoughtful about where these things go and we get that model working right and we make sure that we get them located exactly where we want to get them located. We get gas on them wherever we can. We get them the right distance away from, um, from super centres. Um, we get them on the right side of the road, all, all those sort of things. So, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about what we can do with neighbourhood markets. But we've got to fix some of these basic things, and then we can get into them. Kerry. Thanks a lot. Uh, Matt Fassler, Goldman Sachs, and good afternoon. Um, my, my primary question relates to the incremental investment for 2016 or your, your, your 2017. Can you map that to the math of the wage increase versus other investments that you're making uh, in the store? How much of it is the shift to $10 and how much incremental additional uh, material is there, uh, additional drivers uh, contributing to that increase in investment? I'm not sure whether you're asking about the wages versus other types of people investments or wages versus price. The, the number for the total investment, 75% of next year's total, is related to people. I'm focused on next year's investments, which I understand are primarily wages and labor. That's correct. Right. 75% of it. And is all of that just wage rate, or is there a portion of that that's also related to, to incremental investment in hours or, yeah. or, or structure, et cetera? Yes. Thanks, yeah. got it. Yes, so, so that includes what we're doing in terms of department managers um, and pickup and getting grocery home shop rolled out to many more markets. So that includes that total amount. Michael. Thank you, Oliver Chen from Cowan & Company. As certain pure plays focus on the consumables and apparel markets, what would you say are your competitive advantages in terms of how you work with vendors and how you think about how vendors may play a role and as you uh, elevate the seamless customer experience? Also, on the supply chain side, on some of your earlier comments, just curious about what you mean about improving accuracy 
in driving sustainability? What are the key elements of that? And just lastly, on the price investment side, which categories are you focused on with the biggest opportunities in price investment? Thank you. You mean take supply chain, you take yeah. the other two? Um, the world of retail is moving to more of a pull system than a push in that as customers use a website or a mobile app to tell us what they're looking for and what they want, that increases our, our accuracy as it relates to how we choose to flow that item to a customer and how we anticipate demand. And with today's opportunity with predictive analytics and frankly some of the tools that Neil and his team are starting to develop, point us towards a time where our forecast accuracy could go up, and that's going to be one of the keys to winning. And as we mentioned before, having a supply chain that is connected and more dynamic will help us take out costs. And it's not just transportation and handling, but it's also markdowns. So today, we, we have a distribution system that was largely built in silos. We bring in import goods, they go to an import center. We have grocery centers that handle high turn goods. We've got other distribution centers that handle non-food, general merchandise. We've got apparel centers. And those act independently for the most part. When you start to connect them and you have a good forecast, the path that that inventory follows through the system will be the most efficient path and take more costs out. So you can just imagine a big regression analysis, a, a, a big optimization of a network. And we have more nodes and distribution paths than anybody. So our ability to optimize across that network would be superior to others because of the fact we've already laid down that network. It's a lot of work. And in some cases, building new tools will be need, needed to make it happen. But I'm really excited about it. I can imagine what that's going to look like in the future. And we're starting to make it happen today. Um, first question was, I think, around apparel and consumables and how we, our relationship with suppliers and opportunities there. Um, both those areas continue to perform well. Um, in the case of apparel, you know, I'm, I'm actually really encouraged by what I'm seeing there, despite the fact that it's incredibly warm outside at this point in time. Um, I think our team there, Andy, Barron, Leeds, have done a very good job of basically putting together a good package. Now, there's room to improve that, but I think we've got into opening price points. We've got a good relationship with our suppliers. We're buying at source. Um, you know, he's simplifying the operation. I think there's still room to go. And, you know, we've got to do better work in terms of flowing merchandise. But apparel is going well. Um, I like we, what we're doing there. Consumables, likewise, is, is also performing, and, and that sits under Michelle. And she's working closely with our vendors there, um, large, medium, and small, to once again simplify the business. Um, to get the modulus going right, to get the flow right, to get the in-stock performance right, um, working on price, sorting out the role of private label in these categories. Consumables is a good bellwether <coughs> for our business. It, it drives a lot of foot traffic, always has, and, and it probably will continue to do so in the future. So both business is going well. What was your third question, sorry? Yeah, okay. So. Um, so the, you know, we've, we've outlined that we'll be investing billions over, over several years. Um, we've got a good plan as to how we want to do that, and um, you'll see us get into that. I'm, I don't want to get into the details of that for competitive reasons. You, you know, you can trust that um, we're pretty close to price. I know what the price gaps are. Um, I know what they are on national brands, private label versus competitors, um, you know, regionally, um, nationally, and we really want to get after this. We know it's part of our heritage, and it's going to be important in terms of the overall plan of driving sales growth, and that's really what makes our business work. You get the top line going, and that then forces the productivity loop to turn. And so that's why, you know, you've got to fix the stores. You know, your words are you've got to sort of get the house cleaned up before you invite the guests over. We then have to get in and, and sort out the price. And we can get this business moving. And, of course, you then link in what we can do with Neil's organisation. And I think we've got really good competitive advantage. Now, we'll get one point for talking about it and nine points for doing it. But 
we're after it. We know what we have to do and we've got a plan, it's sequenced. We've costed it out. Now we've got to do it. Carrie. Thanks. Chris Horvers, JP Morgan. Can you share a little background on the experience in the UK with the hard discounters? What was the, the price investment that was needed to close the gap there and how did that impact profitability versus, say, the delivery shift? And then as you think about the billions of price investment in the US, is there a gap that you're trying to close versus them or is it more a defensive tactic? Yeah, great question. I think all of us have talked about that a lot, so some of the other folks may want to chime in too. But I think the first thing I would remind us all of, Chris, is that it's not just price, it's also assortment. And when you think about the role of private brands and and uh, house brands, one of the things that Greg and the team is working on and the team in the UK is working on is do we have the right specs and the right position to compete? And sometimes that takes a little bit of time, but you have to address the assortment issues. There are also key questions to be answered about produce specs, what you do with fresh meat. So it's a combination of fresh food and private brand assortment that have to be um, addressed. And then on top of that, the price investment's gotta be at the right level. Um, on top of what a hard discounter offers, we have obvious advantages. We've got a broad assortment, we're building an e-commerce business that's complementary, the store experience is going to be different, there are service areas in the business where we may do things they don't do, so the total package will matter and we will talk about that with customers as we go forward. The amount of the price investment, both in the UK and the US and in other markets, needs to be managed very thoughtfully and not all at once. And I had a question not long ago from one of you about, well, why don't, why don't you just take a big investment in price, hammer down, you know, put it all in right now? And my response to that and the way that we feel about it is, we have some time to get that right. And if we tried to do it in a really arbitrary way, you know, we'd have some theoretical basis for why it needs to be at a certain level, chances are we'd get it wrong. And what we would like to do is to use this time period that we have with all the work that's going on in assortment and other things to navigate ourselves to that right level. And for competitive reasons, I don't think we'd be a lot more specific than that, but I think hopefully you can tell from, from this response that we've thought that out, we understand what it is that we've decided that we're gonna go do, and we will do it over time. And we'll balance what shareholders need with what customers require of us and the whole piece as we go. We get to make pricing decisions every day ton of variables, a lot of items, a lot of movement, geographies, ton of variables to play with, and we need to do that, you know, intelligently, and we will. I miss anything? I think you covered it well. You know, um, private label becomes key to it. The other thing that's important in the, in the hard discounters is how they play general merchandise. And, you know, it's often referred to in the club stores about creating a treasure hunt. That's also something that that the hard discounters are good at doing. So it's not just getting your food offer, right. which includes fresh and meat. It's also ensuring that you keep really relevant in terms of fantastic general merchandise. Right. But, yeah, it's interesting when we get together, Dave Cheeseright has had good experience at this. Um, you can tell that I'm not from Arkansas um, in Australia. You know, have a look at the market in Australia and have a look at what Aldi has done in Australia. Um, I have got to, to know them pretty well. I've had to compete against them. Um, we'll have another hard discounter opening here in a year's time. And um, I'm looking forward to the challenge. And uh, we know what we've got to do. Now we've got to get on and do it. The yeah, point about general merchandise is a you know, big one. Star Wars has been huge for us. Pioneer Woman, this Reed Drummond product that we just launched, blowing out. The breadth of assortment and the fun that you can have in a super center for customers is there, but we have to manage the assortment and the pricing in such a way that there's not a trade-off for them. Michael. Great. Thanks. Hi, it's uh, Greg Malik with Evercore ISI. Um, I really have two questions. One is, uh, Greg, on the going back to gross margin, shrink was a big hit earlier this year. Should we think of that shrink investment as the first part of a price investment, or what exactly was that, and, and do we think of that as sort of the, the first stage here? And then second, uh, either for, for Doug or Charles, if we think about the whole company uh, and the guidance you provided, where do SAMS International fit in this? Should we expect their EBIT margins to be down 
as well for the next for next year uh, because of some price investment or other uh, investments in e-commerce. Thanks. Do you want to go first? Doesn't matter. Um, shrinkage. Um, as I said, we are really after this, and um, I think if you went out and you spoke to any of our store managers or anyone else in our business, I'll tell you that it's getting plenty of focus. Uh, we've got shrink school back in place, so something that used to be part of our business is now now back in place. So if you if you shrink heavily, then you're off to shrink school um, to to learn what you've got to do to to get on top of it. I'm comfortable with what we've built into our plans going forward. Um, Having done this for 40 years, this is not a five minute fix to fix unknown shrinkage. There are many parts that are at play. Um, it's built into to our guidance and our plans, um, as are many other levers within the business. But I'm comfortable that we're heading in the right direction, we're focused on the right things, and what we've built into the plans, I can sit here, as I said to you last Friday at the officers meeting, we're on the right track. Um, it does help us. As I said, it turns from what I believe is a headwind and it will become a bit of a tailwind. But we're realistic about what we can achieve and how quickly we can achieve it. The SAMS plan looks a lot like the Walmart US plan because it's got the same two pressures. We invested in wages in SAMS Club US just as we did Walmart US and we've got the e-commerce investment. International looks a bit different because the value of the portfolio kicks in and the way Dave is thinking about it. So we've got puts and takes from market to market and he's balancing some of his investments within that portfolio. And it's really helpful, Charles, right now to have momentum in Canada and Mexico, yeah. um, which are two of our more profitable businesses both running strong comps and delivering results. Kerry. Hi, it's Dan Bender at Jefferies. I was um, intrigued by one of the slides you showed earlier that um, showed that Walmart's appeal to a blend of incomes matched that of the broader U.S. shopper. And I guess my question in that is, when you consider your online growth in dollars, relatively large and dollars, but relatively small compared to your largest competitor online. Do you think that there is something that you need to do more from an image perspective for the U.S. consumer in that um, I think a lot of people think about Walmart as, you know, a place to go if you're on a budget. Amazon seems like it's for everybody. And so I'm just wondering if you think there's something you need to do there. And then when you think about the online investments that you've made, it's surprising that the dollar growth isn't more. And so you've told us a lot about what your customer is expecting in the store. What is it you think you need to do more of online to accelerate that growth? Let me take that. So um, first of all, let's talk about customer demographics, and then we'll talk about um, revenue growth, and we'll focus the conversation on the US. So as, as Doug highlighted with that slide, the, the Walmart customer is a value-conscious customer. Um, that value-conscious customer is, uh, spans across uh, different demographics, obviously. Um, and the, with the introduction of technology, technology doesn't discriminate. Technology makes available to those in all um, in all facets of the, the economic spectrum, um, Walmart. There, to our eye, aren't many brands that have brand permission to sell everything to everyone. So that's a big deal. The ability to sell groceries and general merchandise together is, is unique, really, to, uh, to Walmart. So as we think about how to grow the online business and grow the customer, we think about how do we attract new customers to Walmart, which I think is the essence of your, of your second question. And that's by introducing a level of service to our offering that, um, that is different than a mass market discount retailer would historically have provided. That's why you see the progress that we're making with, um, with grocery. If you look at the categories that have moved online, grocery is the last category to move online. And the reason is it's the hardest. So um, we can do that better than anyone else. That provides us a foundation for a relationship which allows us to bring those new customers into Walmart and then deepen the relationship that we already have with them. The second half of your question there, though, is around the assortment expansion, which is um, when, we, when we do the process of, of, of filling a super center um, to its catchment area and to its, its, trading, um, its trading area, obviously the assortment that's in that super center is going to match those, those folks. That may or may not hit the entire spectrum. 
With the addition of online, we now have the ability to expand that assortment. So the 120,000 items online is about 10 million by the end of, or uh, in the stores, about 10 million um, online today, and that continues to grow. Taken together, then, we have, the, we have the assortment, we have the customer experience, and we have the brand relationship with the customer that allows us to drive that deeper, um, that deeper relationship with the customers we already have and to attract and build that, that, um, that deeper relationship with customers that may, maybe we don't have as much of right now. And then as it relates to growth, it's, it's worth, it's worth um, realizing that we're a big business. Only in Walmart are we not a, um, a, you know, only in Walmart would we say our e-commerce business is not a, a big business. So to double, uh, you know, we were at, what, about $6 billion of sales, I think, in 2000, calendar 2011, fiscal 2012. So in three years, we've doubled that business. Doubling at that kind of scale is is um, is really attractive growth. We've taken market and uh, we've taken share in every market in which we uh, we compete, and we expect to continue to do that. Um, but it's really, as I said at the end of my remarks, about how do we grow the whole company? Because it's you know with Walmart, it's about this branded relationship with customers. How can customers across the economic spectrum who want to buy everything from general merchandise to groceries? How do they? Tr how do we build a relationship with them based on the things they are? already know about us, price assortment, access, and experience. They know they can trust us for low prices. They know we sell what they want to buy. Um, we're, we've created a, um, an efficient um, and, and fun shopping experience for them. And we have access that no one else can, um, that no one else can provide. So that taken together says we, uh, we believe that we have, the, we have the customer proposition that appeals to, uh, to a broad swath of the population here in the US. Yeah, I think that's well said. The other thing, Dan, is that the fulfillment centers weren't in place. So our split ships and our costs related to shipping were high. So if we had scaled it a lot faster, it would have been tougher on the P&L. And we're always balancing those things. But the infrastructure that Neil talked about today is, is um, much more developed than it was looking backwards. Michael. Uh, Peter Benedict, the Robert Baird. Uh, Doug, you had mentioned in your remarks earlier um, being open to portfolio rationalization or taking a look at that. So that's happened to some degree at Walmart over the last several years, but um, your comments seem to me at least to have a little bit more bite to them. So just talk to us about how broadly you're thinking about that and, and really how important it is to you as part of the strategic plan over the next three years or so. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Charles, you can help me. I'll, I'll take a shot at it, and then you can fill in the blanks. Being the biggest and being the best are not the same thing. And we've got to be the best. And so these priorities that we're trying to articulate to you that we've set are just that. We have to win in some of these areas for the company to be successful over a long period of time. And it, it's meaningful to me personally that that the company crossed the 50-year mark a couple of years ago. And mentally, I know 50 years sounds like forever, but I'd like to know that this company is going to be here in 50 years and be relevant. And to manage that, we got to manage the next five well and do what's necessary as it relates to being great at technology. I mean, we're, we're adding, Neil, data scientists and mathematicians. And it's a very different Walmart than the one that I grew up in. And, and it's exciting. And as we think about those things in the most important markets, what we're saying to you and everyone else is, we're going to make sure we win there. And if it becomes clear to us that other things, while they may be very important in some ways, keep us from achieving that, then we have to do something about that. So our message is, we understand that there are priorities. We're committed to those priorities. And as things come up, and as in some cases, as we actively pursue something, because as Charles said, we, we are looking at the math and the portfolio all the time. We understand what our investments are. We may make some decisions to do some things, some things differently to deliver against that, that top and short list. Now, having said that, to be repetitive, we won't be too fast about that, we'll be intelligent about it, we'll protect shareholder value. I'm not one that believes in just writing something off because it may be perceived well by some. I'm trying to manage this situation like it's your money and my money because it is my money and I know it's your money. So we, we've got we to gotta be thoughtful about what we do and not everything will happen overnight. But we're clear that we have to win in some certain areas and, and that's very much on, on my mind.
I think you said it well. I mean, remember what Doug said. Um, we know we have to win in North America, specifically the U.S., e-commerce, and then integration of physical and di digital. And we need to make some long-term bets in China. We think that's really important. Doesn't mean the other, the other areas, you know, um, uh, we can't focus on, but at the same time, we don't want to take focus off of what I just said. That's going to be really important. Kerry. <clears throat> Meredith, <clears throat> Meredith Adler from Barclays. I'd like to ask some more detailed questions about your uh, labor investments and maybe just understand a little bit better how it works. So starting with the labor budgets for the store managers, when you are increasing hours, do their labor budgets go up? And are their incentive comps adjusted to reflect the fact that they're going to spend more on labor? Um, yes, happy to, <coughs> happy to answer that. So there's a, a couple of things that have gone, or several things that have gone on. Um, obviously, we've moved the facility start rate. And, you know, once again, to be clear, that doesn't mean every single store got a facility start rate because there's a reasonable percentage of our stores, whether through legislative reasons or um, the state of the market, because they might be in a, in a state where there's high resources, we already are paying well above $9 an hour. But it does include a move for facility start rate for you know, two thirds, three quarters of the stores. We've also changed the structure in store um, and a role that we previously had called a ZMS, which carry, covered a wide portion of the store has effectively gone away. And those people in most cases are either now department managers or assistant managers. So there's been a change in structure. And as well as that, we've added 8,000 more department managers in. We've also had a look at our staffing on our front end. And we're now lining up when we need registers open to when customers are in store. And literally, as I speak, we're rolling out a, a system which initially is going into neighbourhood markets, we'll have that completed this year, and then next year it will go through all super centres that will deal in a much more specific and accurate way with correct scheduling in stores. So what we've got two things happening here, or three things. We're changing the structure of the store, we've moved facility start rates um, up, and we're adding in hours. And we've got to do this really sensibly and carefully because if you go too far, costs go up too much. If you don't go far enough, you don't change your shopping experience and get the customer aligned with the changes that we're bringing to Walmart. So that's what we're balancing. And as everyone's mentioned, we've got another heavy year of investment next year to get that right. Um, but when we get it right, we see improved comp sales. And I, I, maybe I missed your answer. A store manager compensation yes. is perfectly yes. aligned with... That's correct. So if we change that, then they are bonus to the new plan, which would take into account the increased hours. Um, I have another question just about... Um, you've obviously raised wages for your uh, entry-level workers. Have there been any changes in the wages you're going to be paying the people who are not at the entry level who have been with you for a while? So the answer is some small changes. So um, as we introduced the change in April of this year, uh, people who we call them capped, so they hadn't had an increase for several years because they're at the top of their rate, many of these are long-term associates, we gave them uh, an increase. Um, we're now dealing with the other issue that you've raised. We, we call it compression internally. And we're just working out how we manage that on top of moving to $10, on top of more department managers. So there's a population, and as you can imagine in Walmart, it's nothing is ever a small number, um, but there's a population of, of associates who've been with us for maybe 10, 15 years, who now have quite a small gap between what they're earning and what someone who's new into the business. So we're working out how to deal that deal with that, and that is built into our plan and our guidance. Ideally, this starts to look like a ladder, and in some cases it, it has and it does. We want people um, to join the company and have an opportunity to move up. 
We want to create a meritocracy. So one of the other things that we've done is the department managers, which is a highly valued and very important role in the company, have received an increase. And some of them that have the more complicated departments will make $15 an hour next year starting. And so some of the longer tenured associates, we're trying to guide them towards running one of the departments because that gives them an opportunity to move up. And then ultimately, we would like a lot of people to become assistant managers and eventually store managers. We really want to develop a pipeline of talent and to some extent have, but with our growth, our growth, we've stretched that and needed to come back and, and put some of the rungs in the ladder in the right place. Michael. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, guys. Uh, Joe Feldman, Telsey Advisor Group. Just wanted to ask about um, the store managers and the turnover there, because you talked about the clean, fast, friendly stores, and you know, you're at two-thirds today of where you'd like to be, and obviously there's a long way to go. And you've made a few comments. You can very clearly see when there's a good store and a bad store, and you can almost predict what the sales will be. So what are you doing, I guess, about the weaker stores and the turnover of those managers and maybe finding better talent for that store? Thanks, Sean. Sure. Um, so lots of work has been underway, and you know, you'll know you be across some of the changes. So Judith McKenna really runs that part of the business. She's doing a great job. So she realigned her teams, and Mike Moore, some of you will know, has been with us for many years. Um, probably the best big store guy that I've ever met. Walking a store with him is exceptional. He now runs super centers. Julie Murphy runs all the neighborhood markets. They've had a look at their teams. In the case of Mike, he's got six divisionals hand-picked. Um, so he's realigned that team. And then we've got about 50 regionals who report to the divisionals. Once again, hand-picked. And there's been about a 30% change, once again, to be candid with you, in regionals. Um, as the regionals change, they then start to change the market managers. The market managers are the, the group of, of, of our associates that might run eight to 10 super centres, or in the case of neighbourhood markets, 13 to 15 neighbourhood markets. It's because the neighbourhood market's smaller, you can look after more. So what's happening is that as we're making these, these changes, it's cascading down and we're seeing um, turnover in some of the areas, which, once again, to be candid, we're forcing in some cases. Um, in other cases, people are getting promoted and we've done a series of those and there's people like Terry Nanny, um, who comes to mind, who's just now running one of our regions and just doing a marvellous job and a whole bunch of others. We've reinstigated a store manager training school. So even as recently as last week, um, you know, in the office on, on Friday, I think I saw three or four groups of new store managers coming through. Um, you know, you go back several months, we had a few hundred stores without store managers. I can sit here and tell you today that is not the case. We've still got vacancies. And I, my objective is to literally have none. Um, but it's starting to get better, but it doesn't happen overnight. And to become a great store manager takes several years. So we're on the path, we know what we've got to do to fix it, we're doing it, and give us another couple of years and the this, this strength of great people running stores I think will be, will be back. Okay, Greg, you, you set the bar this year for Clean Fast Friendly, and yep. two-thirds have made it so far. Are you going to move that bar next year? Yes, so it's already moved. Um, you, you know, t to be, once again, to be candid, you know, the, the, the level that we were at sort of put us right at the bottom. That's, and we only had 17% of stores that actually got the pass mark at the beginning of the year. Because we obviously track how we rate relative to our competitors. So by moving the bar to where we did, where we're now at 67%, um, is really only getting us to, at best, mediocrity. So that bar's now been moved up so that um, a whole bunch of stores that were green are now going to find themselves red, but they've all been told that, they're bought into that, and so they've now got to strive if they can get to green, then it sort of gets us to the bottom of the first quartile, the leading, the leading group. I want to do better than that again, but let's step our way through this and give people a chance, bonus them around that so they know how serious it is, and you know, we'll get there. Yeah. 
I just think it's important that people understand if the percentage starts to come down, it's partially because we move the bar. Uh, two questions. Charles, for you on capital spending, specifically, how have you come up with the $11 billion number? Is it a top-down number, a bottoms-up number? And why was capital spending in the domestic division this year uh, up more than you planned at the beginning of the year? And then for Neil, uh, subscriptions are becoming a much bigger part of e-commerce going forward, both in services and goods. Where are you in that business? You have Voodoo. You don't seem to be able to marry that. With the retail business, can you talk about some of your subscription strategies? Yeah, I'll, I'll take the first couple on the, the 11 billion. That really is a bottoms up with a top down then review and taking out, looking out three years and then understanding from history what is it that we think we can really spend or not spend or should spend. And that, that just comes as Doug and the executive committee get together and, and talk about what would be the appropriate thing. Then I'm looking at it also at a financial lens. Does this make sense? Um, what happens financially to the company? And we felt like that was the optimum. But like I said, that number can be subject to change if we feel like, for instance, if Greg, if Greg and his team felt like the neighborhood markets, they had the management, um, trained and they had the uh, the fresh areas where they wanted them and we had the sites that we felt like were great for customers you, you could see that number go up but right now that's our that's our best understanding of where we would be I guess the question is, you know, why isn't it 10 million or why isn't it why isn't it 10 billion or used to be 13 billion I mean how well we look know, we look at what do we think we need to do Michael to maintain our stores and you know our, our depreciations nine billion or whatever, I would expect that you would spend that at least to maintain what you have over the long term. And then you look at what are the opportunities and versus if you remember what I said, we want our capex to track our priorities. So we look at those priorities and what investment it will take to make sure that we go through with those priorities like we would want to. That's how we came up with the 11 versus a 12 or, or a 10. Michael, on the uh, subscription relationship with the customer, we think about it, uh, think about it as this digital relationship that, um, that we've been describing today. That's the ante. We would like every one of our customers to be using their mobile app and having an account with walmart.com. That provides the, the foundation of our ability to have a one-to-one -one relationship with those customers. And then we can sell subscriptions, we believe, on, on top of that. And so we've tested, obviously we're testing Shipping Pass, which is a, an, an, un, an unlimited shipping offer. Um, Voodoo is a transactional uh, media business as opposed to a subscription media business. So, um, so they've taken share in, in what they do, which is uh, e the EST business. But as you think about that, that digital relationship, it's a big move for us to have that digital relationship. There was a long conversation about everyday low price and, and the consistency of that relationship. We're past that now to say, hey, you know, a customer expects a personalized shopping experience, and we can deliver that through the device that they have in their pocket. That provides us the foundation on top of which then we start to sell these subscription services and whether that's for razor blades or free shipping or um, or media over time we believe that we can merchandise those once we have that that relationship and we feel good about um, the progress that we're making those will be a bigger part of the future than they are um, than they are today okay we have time for one more question thank you uh, thanks for lunch today by the way, um, <laughs> I, I had actually three questions, one for Doug, one for Greg, and one for Neil. So, Doug, in your earlier presentation, you said you wanted to go where there was growth. In that, it suggested to me that you're looking to go after a little bit of a different customer demographic in America than you have in the past, maybe a bit more influent, because that's where we're getting the job growth and the income growth. So that's the first question I had. Is that an accurate perception? Yeah, I think that'll be the outcome. Um, that doesn't mean that we're going to take our eye off the ball as it relates to opening price points and customers at all income levels. But the nature of e-commerce, the nature of the neighborhood market, and other things that we're doing do create an opportunity for us to be even more relevant to customers that are at the higher end of the scale. Running cleaner stores also does the same thing. So I think if you look at where where we match up against the bell curve in the future, it'll be even closer of a perfect match to what exists in the United States. But I wouldn't want you to think we're gonna walk away from 
customers that are most focused on value. Got it. And then, Greg, uh, in terms of your outlook, your North America segment margin, I think, was seven and a half last year. We kind of work out where you're going to go um, over the years, the next three years. But is the majority of the decline in your gross margin or in your operating margin rate or your segment margin rate to come from gross margin or is it to come from SG&A? Um, I, I think, as we've already identified, a lot of the costs we incur next year is absorbing the extra 1.5 billion that we're investing in store wages. Okay, and in terms of the billions of dollars in savings, in terms of fresh, a lot of the criticism or concern has been in the quality of the value that you offer. So when you say, you know, billions of numbers, is that thinking about it in terms of both enhancing the quality and also lower everyday prices? I've lost you. The a quality of fresh. Quality of fresh. Yeah. Yeah, Greg can, can chime in here, but there are categories where the customer is really focused on price and you sell tide against tide and price is what they're using to make that decision. There are other places where quality is a much more important part of that value equation. Apparel is right. If you don't have the right color, forget about it. In produce, quality is the yeah. thing. And I think when we created super centers, we, we took a lot of our DNA on price and we translated it into what we did on the food side of the box with our fixtures, with our assortment. And especially in produce, um, yeah, but I, also in meat. Yeah. yeah, they work it out, don't they? Um, you know, customers will have a look at your avocado and you might be selling it for 50 cents. And if the guy down the road's selling it for 80 cents, but it's a larger avocado um, and it's demonstrably different, the customer makes a value decision. So, yeah, you know, it's one of the challenges with Fresh, isn't it, is that you need people working in your departments, working in your stores, who are able to make some of those value judgments. Not all avocados are the same. Not all pieces of muscle meat are the same. So you need that ability right through your organisation to make those calls. At the end of the day, where we want Walmart US positioned is to be giving the best value. Um, in Tide, that's got to be, you've got to have the right price. In the case of Fresh, it's a value decision. Okay. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us here today. If you could stay in your seats for just a minute. Um, we are going to conclude our webcast at this time.